Welcome. I am so glad you joined me. Uh, today I'm starting a discussion of the structure of the atom. And it's so important for us to uh, wrap our minds around the structure and be able to describe and model the structure because structure determines function. So if we understand how uh, the, the atom is put together, then we can use that knowledge uh, to cause reactions to happen, for example. So structure determines function. We can understand how atoms behave. Um, there are a lot of people that were involved. Uh, this is what I often call my real old dead guys. And it really started earlier than Dalton. But Dalton talked about the atom as a solid sphere. And we move around and there's many, many people that contributed to our current understanding of the atom and, and some people, you know, even since Schrodinger. Um, but we're going to build up our understanding of the atom um, up to Schrodinger in, um, we won't only really solve Schrodinger's equation, but we'll mention uh, Schrodinger's equation and look at some of the ways we uh, talk about solutions to that. Um, I won't be talking about all these people. They're, it's not that they're not important. Um, it's just time typically doesn't permit. So I'm going to highlight a few of the people, and I'm doing it within um, the goal in mind of understanding how models change as experimentation develops. So models are great, but we want to keep in mind that, um, for one, models often have limitations, and two, an experiment can come about and completely you know, prove a model wrong. And so we want to you know, see how that process um, evolved over time. So with John Dalton's atomic theory, um, he was an Englishman, and he proposed that an atom was like a bill billiard ball. I mean, this goes back to Democritus a long, long time ago. Um, and he proposed all elements are composed of very small particles called atoms, which are indivisible. That's what he proposed. He thought you couldn't split it into smaller. Well, now we know that that proposal uh, is false. We can divide atoms into protons, electrons, neutrons, leptons, gluons, charms, quarks. I don't even know them all because you get into physics at that point. Okay, but the key is atoms are very much divisible into smaller particles. He proposed that all atoms of the same element are identical. So a carbon is a carbon is a carbon. If you've got zinc, they're all going to be the same. And we now know that's false. And that's because of the presence of something called isotopes. And those are forms of elements with different masses. And I will talk more in detail about that. But the point is, we have carbon with a mass of 13, carbon with a mass of 12, carbon with a mass of 14. So they are not all identical. So that's the key point there. More about isotopes later. He proposed atoms of different elements are different, and that is true. He proposed atoms of different elements can combine in simple whole number ratios. That's true. We have CO2, H2O, very simple whole number ratios. We don't have H one half O. Proposed chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged. However, atoms of one element are not changed, and that's true. Atoms are changed only by nuclear reactions, not by chemical reactions. So he got some good stuff right, and the key is, is not to focus on what was false, but how the things that were false and the things that were true spurred on the next level of growth and understanding about the atom. The next one I briefly want to mention, there's some very good animations and videos online about this, so I don't want to belabor it too much, but J.J. Thompson, um, he discovered electrons and protons, but I want to talk primarily about electrons, and he did experiments not quite like this one, this one's a little more 
uh, I think this one's a little more uh, current than what he used, but he determined the mass to charge ratio of an electron. Not just that it was negative, but the mass to charge ratio. It would be a later experiment where we, Millikan would find the mass of an electron. So what he did is he had a cathode ray that emitted electrons, okay? And they went through this focusing coil. You don't need to worry about that so much. Here's what's key are these deflecting coils. And you can do this with a magnetic field or an electric field. But the key is positive and negative with a magnetic field or electric field. And he noticed um, by having that ray impinge on a fluorescent screen so that you could visualize it, that the electron beam bent towards the positive. Well, since negative is attracted to positive, he proposed the negative electron. He didn't get the exact charge uh, in terms of pure coulombs of an electron, but he did d uh, discover that the, there was a, an, a particle, and it was a small particle, and that it was negative. So he came up with what is often referred to as the plum pudding model. So in a plum pudding model, you have not positive charges and negative charges, but rather kind of a diffuse positive field in which these negative electrons are hanging out. So the positive field is like the pudding, and these are like the raisins or plums inside the pudding, just kind of hanging out there. And so he proposed, based on that, that electrons are negatively charged, that they're very lightweight. We're going to find, yes, it's negligible mass. And this was all true. And he proposed this plum pudding model, but we now know, hopefully you know from middle school, that that is false. But that's okay, because he came up with a model, he drew a picture, he found a way to communicate it, and that in turn spurred on the next level of experimentation. Okay, and that would be Ernest Rutherford. So Ernest Rutherford worked for Thompson, and he wanted to do an experiment, and he had some people do an experiment um, called the gold foil experiment. And in this gold foil experiment, what he did is he had alpha rays, and alpha is a helium nucleus. It's got a mass of four and a charge of two. So these alpha particles are fairly large, relatively speaking. Um, and it has a plus two charge. Uh, unfortunately, when they write the alpha particle, they don't put that two positive there. Um, but that has a mass of four, two protons, and no electrons. And he shot that through a gold foil. So thin gold foil. Now, had this been the plum pudding, these big alpha particles would have just floated their way right through the plum pudding. So he expected, the results he expected, when he detected the alpha particles coming through, he expected them to just all go right through the gold foil. And what he found out is that most went through the gold foil, but a few were deflected, much like a one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. And some were deflected very, very slightly, and others were deflected very with an extreme angle. And that's when he found, lo and behold, that we didn't have this diffuse plum pudding, but rather we had a positive nucleus, very dense positive nucleus, electrons on the outside, and you know what? Mostly empty space. So now we have a new experimentation, and we have to fix our model, and that's a good thing. So Rutherford um, came up with that uh, kind of the solid, uh, concentrated, positive nucleus in the center. Okay, so he proposed the atom was mostly space, and that all of the particles 
were positive charge was located in very small nucleus, and that was true. So he he really his experiment was very uh, well. All of them are very good because every little bit that we build knowledge helps us. So it's like you stand on the shoulders of the ones that come before you. Okay. Now Millikan's oil drop experiment with Millikan's oil drop. What he did is he not going to go into a lot of detail on this one. But he charged the oil droplets, so he compared the oil droplets with a charge, and he compared oil droplets without a charge that were neutral. And he looked at how they fell through here. And by comparing how far the zero ones fell, and these, some of the positive ones, were actually kind of suspended up here. Some came down and moved back up and by measuring where those positive charges landed, what he was able to do is to determine the actual magnitude of the charge on an electron in coulombs. So that was very important um, scientific discovery. Now, Niels Bohr, he, I, I just have a love-hate relationship with this, honestly. Um, there are things I love about Bohr's model. Um, I think he brought some great understanding. Unfortunately, um, there are some uh, not so good, I'm trying to find the kindest way to say that, aspects of his model that get perpetuated, especially in middle school. I don't know if you ever did those models where you've got you know, electrons orbiting a nucleus, like planets orbit the sun. Electrons don't orbit. We don't know how they do. But here's what he came up with, which was awesome. Electrons are in specific energy levels, and that's true. Those specific energy levels are what we call quantized. Only some are allowed. Okay, so this is very important study. So in stairs, only certain heights are allowed. Whereas if you have a ramp, in theory, every single height is allowed. So he proposed energy levels, and that was awesome. But he also proposed that planetary model. And you know, you could probably interview people coming out of Harvard that weren't science majors, and they'd still think electrons orbit. We don't know how electrons orbit. The best we're going to come up with is a region in space where there's a 90% chance of finding an electron with a given energy. I like to call it the electron playground. Um, not exact science language, but very helpful. So I like to focus on his good stuff, and we'll leave that planetary model behind at this level. Electrons move somehow. We don't know how, but they move around the nucleus, and this is key, in energy levels. Not all energy levels are allowed, Energy levels are said to be quantized, and more on that in another video. Okay, and then finally we get to Schrodinger and de Broglie and Heisenberg, and we get into some complicated mathematics at this point of looking at wave and particle nature of um, electrons. Are electrons particles? Are electrons waves? And we have to say, Yes, at least those mathematics explain how electrons can be found, where they can be found. We look at a region in space where there's 90% probability of finding an electron with a given energy. <sighs> and we will call that, sadly, an orbital. Okay, more on this atomic model in future videos. Thanks for joining me for this introduction.